Well, I wish you a good morning today and I'm delighted to see you here with us for uh, another period of study and worship today. We have with us a good friend of mine and his family, Gary and Deborah Dull and their grandson Logan. I spent some time while I was in school with Gary. I think I was in third year when he came in first year. So I got to know Gary quite well and they're traveling home this morning from an event and decided to join us. So good to see you all with us today. And uh, I don't recognize any other visitors, but if we do have others, thankful for you being here today too. Uh, as was mentioned, our vacation Bible school begins tonight and I have made it a habit since we have a four-day VBS to take the lesson that we've omitted and preach on that lesson, the Sunday VBS begins. So that's what I'll be doing today from John the 14th chapter. Our VBS this year centers around uh, studying about and learning about the I Am statements of Christ. And uh, our children are much more interested in this part of it than the adults will be. But our, our theme is kind of uh, taking a journey on this ship through the I Am statements of Christ, at least as I understand it. And so we'll begin that, day, that journey this morning by thinking about the statement Jesus makes in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father except through me. Now you might be interested to recall to your minds this morning that this portion of Scripture records for us one of the last discourses Jesus uh, delivered to His apostles before His death. Now, they are having a very difficult time coming to grips with the fact that their king was going to have to die. I mean, he just foretold them back in the end of John chapter 13 that one of the apostles was going to betray him and that he would be delivered into the hands of men. That's John 13 verses 21 to 26. And of course, these poor apostles, as they often had difficulty understanding the true nature of who Jesus was and what He was about, they don't get it. They're thinking to themselves, what do you mean, Jesus? You're not going to die. You're, you've come to save the world. You're the king. You, you're the one who's going to conquer the Romans. Well, you, you can't die. And so when they finally understand that Jesus is not joking with them, that He's telling them the truth, they find themselves very disturbed and deeply upset. It's almost as if like a month ago we talked about that question, why they don't understand they don't know why Jesus has to die, even though over and over again He's trying to teach them and get them to, to try to see what He was really about. What a monumental occasion this must have been for the apostles. Them being distressed over the death of Jesus. Jesus had already told them that they're going to be without wealth, without friends, and without honor. That's in Matthew 26, verse 31. Now, now, I can't help but imagine, knowing what I know about these apostles, that they must have thought, as they began this journey with Jesus, that they must have been going to be rewarded handsomely for their service. And yet now they're finding out that, that, that they're going to be without even the basic necessities of life. Now, I want you to try to put yourself in their position and understand how discouraged they must have been. And so Jesus finds it necessary to comfort them. You know, before we proceed, I want you to, to know that sometimes we're a lot like those apostles. There are things we don't understand in life. All kinds of events that happen to us that, that we, we just, we don't know. We don't know the why. We, we don't want to be in these situations. We, 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 we just can't grip, come to grips with it. We can't wrap our mind around why things happen to us. And that's the situation the apostles are in right now. And so Jesus comforts them in the first six verses of John 14. They feel like there's no hope, no reason for life itself. And I'm sure there might be someone here today who may feel quite similar to what the apostles felt. And yet Jesus knew about their discouragement. Jesus knew they needed to be comforted. And so that He does. And in comforting them, He challenges them to see that this event was part of God's plan from before the creation of the world. 
And so their hope is in a state of deep despair and needs to be strengthened. But I want you to remember as we read and study together this morning, that it's not only the apostles who are in deep distress. Jesus knows what's about to happen. Jesus is, is not necessarily discouraged, but certainly uh, we might say that he's a little distressed about what's going to happen. I mean, nobody gets excited about dying, do they? Well, some people do if their life is right. But, but Jesus knows what's waiting him, and yet in the midst of this turmoil that's about to transpire, Jesus is being a great encourager. So we come to the first verse of John chapter 14 and Jesus says, No, you've got it all wrong. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, don't you? you? Believe also in me because in my Father's house there are many mansions and if that weren't the truth, I would have told you so. And what I'm doing, I'm going up there to prepare a place for you and if I do that, I'm going to come back and receive you to myself so you can be with me where I am. How comforting that must have been for these people. I want to look at these statements this morning. Let not your heart be troubled. Their faith was in deep despair. Or, or their, their, their heart was in, in deep trouble. And I want to suggest to you this morning a few things that would help their despair. Number one, their faith would alleviate their troubled hearts. Now they did believe in God, right? Yes, they, they did. They believed in Jesus. They understood some things. Knowing this, that they did believe in God, knowing that they believed in Jesus, what Jesus must have meant here was that since you believe in God, then believe in me also. You already know that God is. You, you have faith in God. Trust me. Believe in me also. That's what Jesus is saying to them. And if they believed in God and if they believed in Christ, they should have remembered the words of the great psalmist in Psalm 46 and verse 1, so as not to become troubled. Uh, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. See, folks, it is our faith that ought to minimize our worries. I know there's things that you might be worried about this morning and anxious and, and you don't know the answers to all the questions. You're, you're asking yourself why. But folks, I'm telling you, faith can help alleviate those problems. Your faith, not mine. Mine can alleviate my problems and, and my discouragement, my distress. But your faith can alleviate your problems. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and who are called according to His purpose, Romans 8, 28. And we know that Jesus promised His disciples, even in Matthew 6 and verse 33, that if they would seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that all these things they were worried about, the food, the clothing, the shelter, they'd be provided to them. Oh, we've got nothing to worry about because God is on our side. So their faith would help their trouble. Number two, the Father's furnishings would help their trouble. By that I mean His provisions, those things which He had furnished for them. You know, Jesus says, in my Father's house there are many mansions. You know what that literally means? Jesus essentially says to them, in my Father's heaven there are many rooms. I like that translation much better. There are many rooms there. In other words, it's spacious, it's vast. There are many places to abide. See, folks, the belief that there is a heaven, and a heaven that Jesus describes here, it increases our hope and it helps us bear our troubles. It did the Apostle Paul. You remember what he said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, right? For I know, we know that if our earthly house, this tent, in other words, his body, if this body is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And Paul was not without his worries and frustrations and discouragements and distresses, but he says that I know that when this body is destroyed, something better is waiting. See, the Father's furnishings, along with our faith, help alleviate our troubled hearts. Folks, I don't know about you, but 
when I find that I'm having a difficult time with hope and faith, you know what I do? I think about heaven. Paul said in Colossians 1 and verse 5 that because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, which things you've heard before the word of truth of the gospel. And I use that hope of heaven that is laid up for me to, to, to alleviate my troubled heart. Our faith and the Father's furnishings, the provisions, they alleviate our troubled heart. But number three, Christ's frankness or His truthfulness alleviates our troubles. You know, Christ was always frank with the apostles. He warned them of the hardships they would face when they became His disciples. It's not as if, as if Jesus had painted a beautiful picture of what discipleship was about. No, no, no. You go back and you look when Jesus called the disciples. Uh, he, he told them to, to leave everything behind and come and follow me. And he even told them, he says, you, you know something? The Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay down his head. They knew that it was going to be difficult. And Christ was up front with them about that. You know what? He's, he's done the same with us. He never promised you and He didn't promise me that the Christian life would, would be easy. Not one time did He ever say to, to Gary Haas that, that you're not going to be persecuted. No. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If they hated me, Jesus said, they're going to hate you too because of who you love and serve. Jesus was truthful. He was frank with us. And these three things coupled together help alleviate our troubled heart. Let's look at that second statement in John 14 and verse 2. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. You see, something they needed to understand is that although Jesus would die, there was a purpose to his death. It's not as if Jesus was just going to die and disappear forever. It wasn't as if He was just going to leave them on the earth to, to fend for themselves. No, Jesus says, I'm going, I'm going to die, but I'm going for you. And right now at this very present moment, that is true of Jesus. He is there preparing a place for you and for me. You talk about alleviating your troubled heart to know that that's what Jesus is doing. He's not up there just, just sitting back, kicking back and watching our life and, and saying, boy, I wish I could help them. No, He's there preparing a place for you and for me. I go to prepare a place. Now, there was a prerequisite for that, His death. He couldn't go to heaven and prepare that place if He didn't first die. And so His death was very important. The apostles, they certainly would have wanted to inherit the place called heaven, but it was an impossibility, an impossibility if Jesus didn't die first. They would never have the hope of heaven if Jesus didn't die. They need to understand this and, and hopefully this would help alleviate their troubles. You know... Uh, no matter how the apostles felt, Christ was demonstrating His love for them. Let's not forget that, folks, because though they may have felt discouraged, though they may have thought that Jesus was leaving them and hanging them out to dry, no, Jesus was actually showing His love for them. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. God demonstrated His own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 and verse 8. Oh, that, that's why He did what He did, because He loved them and He loves us. He went to heaven. He died for you and for me. That's the prerequisite. But there was a purpose behind this. I want you to think about that word prepare. I'm a firm believer that since Jesus went to prepare a place for us and that the Bible teaches that Christians must constantly be in a state of preparation, heaven's a prepared place for a prepared people. You realize this? Jesus went there to prepare this place for you. And we're here preparing ourselves for that place. 
And folks, God has always prepared a place for His people, hasn't He? Go back to the beginning of time. Didn't He prepare the Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve? Certainly He did. You skip forward many generations to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Didn't God prepare the land of Canaan for His people? Absolutely He did. You think about uh, several centuries beyond that. You, you think about this wonderful institution that we are blessed to be a part of today called the church. Jesus prepared the church for us. And there He is now in heaven preparing a place for us where we could spend all eternity in the presence of God. You see, whatever preparation is needed, Jesus has gone to do it. Let's look at the third statement. If I go, I will come again. I don't know about you, but, but I think if I was one of the apostles on the, in this situation, this may have been one of the most comforting thoughts to them. I, I mean, sure, it would have alleviated their, their, faith, or their, their distress and troubled hearts to know that He was going to prepare a place. But oh, how much more to know that Jesus Himself promised them that He was coming back. You look at me and you say, Preacher, when? I can't answer that question. I simply do not know. I don't have the capability. I, I don't have the, the infinite wisdom to know when Jesus will come back. But I know because He promised it, it will happen. If Jesus were going to leave them, it was important for the disciples to know that He would come back. And that's why Paul encouraged Titus in Titus 1 and verse 2 and verse 13 to look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Look for it. You, you, it it's as sure as the night and day. You can promise, you can bet your bottom dollar that Christ is coming back. Just look for it. That great description of that second coming in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. The moment in the twinkling of an eye will be changed, and the last trump, the shout, and the voice of the archangel, he's coming back. So they expected this promise, but, but the promise was exciting. You know, I, I know a lot of people who think members of the Lord's Church are plain old boring. Don't have any zeal or enthusiasm. We're not happy people. Folks, I, I don't know if that's you or not. I know what I've observed of you. You know what you've observed of me. But, but what do we, how do we really live our lives? Because this promise that Jesus made... If I go, I will come again. That's exciting to me. It, it certainly is something that I expect, but it's exciting to me to know that Jesus is coming back. It was more than just a topic for conversation. The apostles found something to be excited about and, and how encouraging it must have been for them. I want you to notice that Jesus said, If I go, I will come again and receive you to myself he's coming for us he's not going to send for us he's coming for us at which point we'll be with him forevermore so the promise was exciting you can look for the second coming of Christ and, and if you've lived your life the way God expects you to live it you can get excited about it knowing that, that this old world will be gone. How exciting. I want to close this morning by looking at that threefold statement in John 14, verse 6. We're going to skip down, and certainly Thomas didn't quite understand, and, and frankly, Thomas was quite brave, because I don't believe any of the apostles understood, but yet it was Thomas who had the courage and the bravery to speak up and say something about it. Jesus looked at him and he said, The way you shall know and the way you shall go. 
And Thomas just speaks up and he says, don't know what you're talking about, Lord. How can we know the way and which way should we go? And, and that's what prompted Jesus to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Thomas, you want to know the way? You want to know which way to go? You, you don't know where to turn? I'll tell you which way to go. Me. Follow me. Do what I did. Say what I said. Follow me. Of course, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 23, Jesus is described, and the new covenant is described as a new and a living way. It was a way that was prophesied by Isaiah chapter 35, verses 8 through 10. A way of holiness, a, a highway for all people of all times. And it's a way that provides our only access to God. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom also, notice this, Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Through whom? Through Jesus. Through the way. There are a lot of people today who are hung up on God's grace. I love the grace of God because without it, I'd be the worst of the worst. Never have a chance in the world of heaven. But God tells me, Paul tells me in Romans chapter 5, that if I want that grace, it comes only through Jesus. Just as Jesus said, He was the only way for us to access God. This way, it's a way of light. Jesus Himself said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. That's part of following Him. Which way shall we go, Thomas said? The way of light. That's me. That's Jesus speaking to Thomas. I'm the way. But He also says, I'm the truth. You know, Jesus loved to speak about the truth, didn't He? Loved speaking the truth to people. Then Jesus said to those, to those who believed on His name, If you continue in My word, then you are My disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31, 32. The truth shall set you free. Well, folks, if Jesus said, I am the truth, then what does that mean? You want to be set free from sin, slavery to Satan, it comes through Jesus. The truth shall set you free, but Jesus said He was the truth. And our world today is sorely lacking in that thing called truth. And all Christians everywhere would do well to heed the advice of Solomon in Proverbs 23, 23. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Do everything in your power to get the truth, and once you've got it, don't ever get rid of it. The truth. Maybe one of the other most encouraging things Jesus said to the disciples here was that He was the life. I am the life. You know, man lost access to the tree of life when Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden. And one day we will regain access to that tree of life. It won't be on this cruel, hateful world. You'll not find it here. But one day God has promised to us in the book of Revelation that we will regain access to that tree of life. But if we want to get there, we've got to understand that Jesus is the source of all life. He's the source of physical life, according to Genesis 1.26, Colossians 1 and verse 16 especially. He's the source of our spiritual life, Ephesians 2 and verse 1, because He made us alive. We were dead, but He made us alive. And He's the source of our resurrection life. 
John 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus said, Don't marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave shall come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And Jesus is the source of that life. I know that, folks, because of what He did with Lazarus and the discussion that He had with Mary and Martha in John chapter 11. And He brings this abundant life, life to the fullest extent, John 10 and verse number 10. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, but no man comes to the Father except through me. You can't come to God any longer by Judaism. As a matter of fact, Paul says if you try to do that, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, you have fallen from grace. You can't come to Jesus or can't come to God, rather, through the doctrines and commandments of men because Jesus said in Matthew 15 that that's called vain worship. We cannot come to God through morality alone because... Though Cornelius didn't try to do that, Cornelius was a just man, a righteous man, a religious man. But he still had something that was missing and lacking in his life. No, no, you can't come to God in these ways. You can only come to God through Jesus. Not by faith alone, James 2, 24 and 26 says, that does you no good. It's dead being alone but through Jesus and Jesus alone. See, folks, I may not have been done the best job this morning expounding upon this topic, but this I know, that the apostles were deeply disturbed. I know that they must have been troubled, they must have been anxious, fearful, disappointed, and had the most troubled hearts that any human could have ever had. But Jesus was able to encourage them. And I want you to know today that Jesus can encourage you by understanding that if you believe in Jesus, you believe in God, you can believe in Jesus. You can trust Jesus. That there are many rooms in the Father's heaven, the Father's house, and Jesus has gone there to prepare that place for you. Knowing that He is the way, the truth, and the life, and that the only way you come to God is through Jesus Christ. See, Jesus ensures the disciples that that He's not leaving them there alone, but that there was something far better waiting for them on the other side of eternity. I don't know what your struggle is today. I don't know what it is that's causing you anxiety, fear, discouragement, disappointment, or distress. But this I know, that Jesus is still the answer to that, or the cure to that problem. And If you need to come today and and for nothing else than just to let us pray for you, we would love the opportunity to do that. You don't know which way to turn. You're, You're anxious. You're depressed distressed, discouraged. Prayer can change a lot of that. Maybe you're experiencing those attitudes and and those lifestyles because you're living a life of sin. Why not come today and change that? Whether you're a Christian and and you need to rededicate your life through confession and repentance of sins, or, or maybe you're not a New Testament Christian, therefore you need to obey the gospel. You've heard a lot of God's Word today. The Bible teaches you must repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3. Confess your faith before these good people, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, and then be immersed for the forgiveness of sins, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. If you need to do that today, so you can be confident about your future, so you can alleviate some of the worry, the guilt, the fear, the discouragement from your life, why not do that? You need to come to the way, the truth, and the life today. We give you the opportunity right now as we stand and sing. On behalf of the Longville Road Church of Christ, I want to thank you for joining us today for our worship. If you ever have an opportunity, we invite you to join us at our physical location at 1301 Longville Road in Kingston, Tennessee. We hope you will come experience the simplicity of New Testament Christianity 
learn about God, and become a part of His family. If you have questions, if you would like to know more about the Bible, or if you would like a home Bible study, feel free to contact us by calling 865-717-0444. Or, for more information, visit our website, www.lawnvilleroadcoc.org. Again, we thank you, and we hope you have a blessed day.